Cool. So uh, great to see everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, the chance to uh, speak to you. What I want to do now is kind of like give a, a um, kind of like longer term, longer arc uh, discussion for a moment um, and kind of like point to longer term um, perspective for uh, uh, for IPFS and so on, kind of calling out to kind of uh, long term goals that have been part of the project for, for a while um, and then talk about some very big opportunities that the community has this year uh, so that people can kind of orient against those specific kinds of projects and take advantage of certain things. Um, this is a, an IP, um, starting off a bit of the discussion with, um, I think called the IPFS project roadmap, which you can find on GitHub. There's like a, a set of like very large scale um, goals uh, spelled out there in terms of many different kinds of uh, ways in which IPFS could be used. Um, uh, the project as a whole has been, uh, followed many different trajectories over time. It's used in a bunch of different applications and so on. Um, there's a massive scale of use around blockchains because that's an area where content addressing makes a lot of sense. Um, but there's a lot of other applications and all other kinds of use cases that don't relate to that um, that maybe get a lot less of attention and, and so on over time. So things that I want to maybe draw attention to that haven't seen um, a ton of uh, scale yet is things like um, partition tolerant networks where uh, you saw the video from Birdie and like that's a good example of, of that in use, uh, but that's kind of like small um, use case. We, we haven't yet seen uh, large scale partition networks um, in flight where like you, you should be able to kind of move around large swaths of data. So think of like all the data that maybe some community might use um, in, in kind of the sneaker net type uh, environment. Content addressing lets you do that. Um, the gaps there uh, relate to kind of implementations. So uh, a lot of the things that are probably holding back those use cases is finding good implementations that target those use cases. Um, I think everything right now is sort of rate limited by um, a few implementations trying to serve all the use cases. So a really big shift that has to happen this year or next year is around um, starting to tune implementations per use case. Uh, so I, I like to describe this in terms of um, kind of how the, the HTTP implementations had to uh, open that up. So initially HTTP uh, was called, th there was a binary called HTTPD and you would like install the HTTP uh, client and server and it would be a program that you would run in your terminal and you would type HTTPD and like you would run the server or you would type HTTP to run the client. And for a while, like for many years, something like I think three or four years, um, maybe more, like that was the main, uh, the main client. Over time, people started um, sending around patches and there were suddenly multiple versions of HTTP and HTTPD. And suddenly, but still that, that was like what the web meant. It was like those specific binaries. Later, Apache came in the picture and was like, hey, like, let's create something new and created Apache 2. And like now you could install Apache 2. But that also kind of bottlenecked and created like one big web server that everybody had to use. There were other ideas and so on along the way. But what really opened up the web to be used in tons of cases was the emergence of um, be, being able to have clients and servers as libraries in a bunch of implementations and really treating HTTP as a protocol and writing programs and servers in, in kind of a large um, variety of use cases where you weren't reliant on a specific implementation. What that means here is that we need to shift the use of IPFS from depending on a single implementation to treating it as more of like a set of libraries and tools that you use for your particular application. So very concretely what, what that might mean is like a, a really great opportunity here this year is in, in creating an executable oriented um, implementation for IPFS where you can um, uh, think of feeding programs into some runtime that then runs the, runs the network stack as opposed to kind of like the, the opposite of that which right now you might uh, download Go IPFS, install that locally and then run programs that maybe speak to it. So that's a, a very different conception um, and that's a, if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, should go, go, you know, kind of explore both this use case, these set of like perspectives and so on and the, these kind of, kinds of potentials um, and talk to other groups that are, that are um, orienting around these, these use cases. Uh, I'm gonna like hop around uh, roadmap for a moment. Um, uh, we saw this upgrade path uh, thing before. There's a lot of like good efforts in get kind of closing that gap. Another implementation here I think is needed. The uh, Go IPFS today is already embedded in Brave, but it's not an implementation that's tuned for the browser. So people could write um, an implementation that's tuned for use in browsers and embedded devices, and that's a really good opportunity. And that'll look a bit different than in OSs. So if people want to um, put bring IPFS into embedded devices and embedded systems and so on, um, that ends up needing a different kind of implementation. So one possibility here is to write 
um, uh, plugins for kernels and so on that uh, can do content addressing and can move around uh, IPLD data and so on, but that are tuned for this kind of use case. This use case and the browser use case are pretty different. So you might end up with multiple implementations. The thing they should not do is like try to depend on Go IPFS specifically or JS IPFS specifically or Lotus or anything like that as solving these use cases. These are like different tools, different systems. So they're big opportunities. Like these are probably entire startups could be built around these, these kinds of things. Um, mobile is another one. Uh, uh, when you want to tune for uh, the use cases of mobile applications and moving around like lots of data, um, but in a kind of device that is sensitive to battery use and network and so on, uh, that, that's where you end up with like, again, a, a different kind of implementation. Uh, there's a really good um, startup for this, which is Go Mobile, um, which I think the Birdie folks have built and maintain. Um, go check that out if like, you're interested in this kind of, kind of thing. Um, one other, uh, something that's maybe useful is to look at the IPFS network as, I wish I had like a, um, I'll make like a nicer graphics version of this someday, but uh, this is a view into kind of like the broader IPFS network. There are, there are many different um, sets of networks that are connected by, by the protocol. Uh, you can use things like the broadly public IPFS DHT to find some of the content, but there are a whole other set of networks that don't directly connect. So when, whenever you're talking about the IPFS network, uh, this is what you should look at. Um, you, it, since the time when this slide was made, which was I think a couple of years ago, and now, um, another massive network has appeared here, which is the Filecoin network. It's, 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 in terms of data use, it's enormous, and, and I'll uh, describe in a, in a moment like how you can take advantage of it. But, um, but even so, like uh, the, the idea of like these partition networks and large amounts of content moving around them um, is, is not well. It, it's both there as, as a possibility and not yet what, uh, taken advantage of because I think we're missing we're missing good implementations. Um, uh, we talked a bit about. Uh, content routing systems. Uh, this is an area that that is has had been a bottleneck for a long time, and finally the the improvements to both the DHT and the delegated routing protocol came in. Um, and so now getting the greatly dropping down the content discovery is is a phenomenal kind of um, outcome. What we'll probably see more and more though is load in those those indexer nodes uh, translating into needing um, uh, better systems that have better properties. So so one one range of problems to attack here is around uh, reader-writer privacy in these systems. So content routing, once you move into content addressing and content routing, um, you encounter a whole set of like, other really critical properties that you would want systems like this to do, uh, which relate to censorship persistence, relate to privacy, relate to security, uh, which, which is you want these content routing structures to be, uh, to protect reader and writer privacy. You want to be able to publish content in the network and have the network not know who exactly published the content. You want to be able to read content in the network and have the network not be able to see that. Today, uh, there are no good large-scale systems deployed that can do this. Uh, there's a few, like even things like Tor, which are widely used and a lot of people use for, uh, for, the, for that kind of uh, censorship persistence, can be spotted. Like you, you can, there, there are attacks you can mount around Tor that can, uh, can look at all of the content uh, moving in and out, and you can correlate the traffic. So, this is a whole area where the entirety of Web3 sort of has to go and, and work on these sets of problems. And solving these, again, it's like whole start, not, not only whole startups, it's like whole crypto networks are likely going to be built to solve this set of problems. So um, arriving at a good um, content addressed, uh, content routing system that can do, that can preserve reader writer privacy at scale to be able to do kind of like sub 100 millisecond queries, like that's a very large scale problem. Um, that this community has to go solve, and it's a huge set of opportunities. So if, if you're in the space, interested in blockchains, interested in these kind of problems, looking for a project, uh, here's, a, here's a really good, really valuable idea. Um, one other thing I wanted to uh, talk about, I, I mentioned kind of like the, the Falcon network as one massive um, uh, system. So here's like a view of the Falcon network where you have kind of a set of storage clients, um, onboarding data into the network through a set of uh, on-ramps, things like NFT storage, Web3 storage, um, Fission, Estuary, Bitbot, Fleek, there's a bunch of these. And then eventually that data makes its way into source providers. Um, source providers then, um, can, you can pull out the data from source providers through uh, different kinds of retrieval pro um, providers. So retrieval networks, the IPFS gateway, there are a ton of different IPFS gateways, um, uh, content routing, uh, so content delivery uh, networks and so on. And so, virtual clients are over here. Now, of course, you can go like 
source clients directly to source providers and back out, but this is way slower. Like this is like a traditional data center type uh, operation. You wanna be able to go much faster. Uh, indexing here, this is kind of where the content routing piece lives. Um, the, a very common pathway here is to onboard vast amounts of data through here, get it all, all the way to SPs, index the content, and then make this kind of retrieval loop uh, pretty fast. So uh, to give a sense of scale, the capacity of, of storage providers is, is in the you know, 15, uh, getting on 16 exabyte range. That's an enormous amount of capacity for storing everything, right? So like the, the entirety of the Web3 um, data set outside of Filecoin is about like three to four petabytes or so, like last time I looked at, it, looked at it. So you can store all of that and replicate it multiple times over and not touch uh, this capacity. So the, the, the Falcon Network is now onboarding a, a large amount of data. Um, there's been a massive gargantuan effort for, from the whole community to um, start take, making use of that capacity. Um, and it's getting to like, I think like 70 petabytes of use. Uh, this, I think this is, this is not the duplicated, so it's probably like kind of like a 10, five to 10 X copies there. So that would be, you know, seven to eight petabytes. It's still kind of like a bunch of data beyond all the Web3 data. That's um, more like Web2 type of data coming online with kind of some large replication factor. Uh, and this is kind of like a sense of the data being onboarded per day. So this is like, um, I think on average 400 today, like in the last week or two, uh, 400 terabytes per day being added onto the network uh, with you know, some, some spikes above um, a petabyte, but you know, these are sort of like short lived. That's a huge amount of data being added to the network daily. Um, so all of that is kind of coming from uh, either large scale deals from source clients directly to source providers or coming through these on ramps. Uh, in terms of CIDs, in terms of content that you can address, uh, address this is an enormous amount of data that you can then start pulling out. So what are people gonna do with this stuff? Um, in many cases, it's uh, archival information, so being able to kind of back up a bunch of storage that people care about to be able to look at it later. In a lot of cases, it's um, data that people want to um, uh, disseminate out to users or they want to compute on it on blockchain, so being able to kind of store the data and then be, be able to run some other kinds of computation associated with that data around some blockchain. So for example, all the NFTs uh, fit into this category. Uh, today, NFTs are a very small amount of data. Like they're, they're a huge number of NFTs, uh, but most of them are 2D images, um, even some 3, 3D objects, still very small. Um, what peop where people wanna go, kind of like the frontier of all of this is like, once you've created this like massive onboarding of data, you wanna then be able to um, do run computations on it. And so that's something that's gonna come to the uh, to the FATCO network um, uh, this year and next year. It's the ability to kind of first run a set of um, smart contracts to be able to kind of um, operate on the state of the network uh, and then use that as a hook to introduce um, computation around the data. So then be able to run provable computation uh, orchestrated by some kind of like task scheduler around um, uh, FEM and so on to then be able to compute on all of this IPFS data on top. So um, th that's sort of like, the way that that looks is like to kind of like run the jobs in the, in the SPs because you can think of those, those nodes as being like this lar set of large scale nodes that have you know, petabytes of, of storage um, and a bunch of GPUs that then can run, uh, run computations over. So that's kind of like, so, so how, do you, how, can, uh, how can you take advantage of, of this massive amount of capacity and kind of like onboarding rate um, to kind of like tune it uh, for your use case? I think today, like if you're dealing with a lot of static data that where you either it's for archival purposes or for uh, content delivery. This might be uh, a good fit. For the content delivery case, you do have to, the, the kind of like retrieval providers here um, are um, on like an improvement rate, but they're, they're still kind of not able to deliver massive amounts of, of, of bandwidth uh, in a very short latency. So you might, your mileage will vary here. Like the onboarding pathway has been greatly improved over the last um, six to 12 months. The retrieval pathway is sort of like the next, the next big thing to improve. Uh, although already now, uh, a lot of people are getting pretty good latency for depending on the data set size. So if you have like um, a few terabytes or a petabyte even of data you want to get close to the users, um, it, you, can, you can get there. You, you'll probably have to do a bunch of lifting yourself to set up clusters and so on to, with low latency. Um, if you have like smaller data sets than that, you can use the on, the on ramps. Th those on ramps already have very nice delivery. So like NSU storage is a good example of getting sub-second delivery of all their content out to retrieval clients. Um, but now if you wanna like serve much higher, uh, much larger stuff, so like many petabytes, that's, um, that's still kind of, there's a lot of work to do there to, to scale that delivery. 
So depending on your use case, if you want to kind of like, um, I, I think what this might work really well for today is video. So we, we've like uh, enabled all of this now to for somebody to like come around and create something like video.storage, where you can create like a um, super scalable way to onboard massive amounts of video into this network, take the subset of the video that you need to load quickly, so the index over the data in the beginning, preload all of that very close to the users, uh, while you kind of like amortize the loads for the rest of the video. Um, and so you might be able to, to use all that. Down the road, if you want to get either involved in building computational networks or in building um, uh, applications of, of computational networks, this is stuff to look into towards the end of the year or next year. Um, uh, so many groups will probably want to get started now, depending on what you're doing. Um, but yeah, so this is like a pretty interesting set of use cases. Uh, cool, I think probably the last uh, thing I'll mention today is uh, there's a whole new wave of scale that's going to come to um, net networks like um, IPFS and networks like Filecoin and many other blockchain systems where today most um, blockchains are not able to deal with um, the kind of computation that the Web2 world deals with. So we're many, many orders of magnitude away. Uh, but this is sort of where the, entire, the entirety of the industry is headed, being able to do kind of like billions of transactions per second or trillions of transactions per second. But it'll take on the order of like two to three years to get there. Um, but if, if you sort of like treat this as like a North Star, there's a the bunch of different projects that are going to come in to scale the operations of these chains to be able to hit that kind of, the kind of scale of, of computation. Um, so once that starts hitting, like you, you'll really be able to do uh, full on kind of virtual world type experiences with um, uh, very high transactional throughputs and be able to run entire games and so on um, through, through systems like this. So this is kind of like where, where the range of the, of the architectures of Web3 are headed, um, but they're, you know, it'll take a while to, um, to really flesh out and get there. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, any, I blazed through a bunch of stuff. Wanted to give you a preview of the things that uh, I'm pretty excited about that um, I'm working on directly and so on, um, but also happy to answer any questions that people have about any of this or the IPFS project or whatever I can help with. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this one? Maybe this is like a better view. Yeah, you, you can find this on fem.falcon.io. Uh, any other questions? Yep. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Sebastian here. Oh. Sebastian. Hey. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have a question in terms of uh, what you see in terms of the infrastructure and latency uh, being built out here. I know like in the finance industry and other things, you still use like magnetic tape decks for really long-term stuff. Um, I, I sort of look at IPFS as kind of an interim uh, state of, of data in, in between. For instance, when we have scientists have large data sets who want to get it out there for, I don't know, 10 months, that might work. Uh, but like is each protocol you were talking about in the very beginning something that will add on top and then we have like robotic tape deck kind of things that are funded through Filecoin and through some of these other? So, so I think right now Filecoin specifically is not tuned for tape. Uh, Falcon is tuned for hard drives, not even SSDs. Like the, your big, best bang for the buck will be hard drives. Yeah. Uh, my sense is that there will be other, um, either adjustments to the core protocol that might come in as FIPS or um, layer two type things that will enable tape decks to come online. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of groups that want to use tape uh, to be able to, to leverage that. Um, a problem to solve there, like the, the, the hurdle, is how do you do uh, a proof of replication over tape uh, that works well. Like that's very difficult because um, you don't want to be spinning up tape uh, all the time. Like that'll degrade the, the tape and degrade the machines. Um, and you want like very high confidence that that has actually happened. So you need some way to enable that. Uh, if your goal is to use it for uh, power in the consensus. You may just do tape storage with like very infrequent uh, uh, proofs of storage but, and so that can get, show you that the data is there, uh, but it won't tell you much about how quickly you can access it or anything like that. Um, my sense is that kind of stuff will probably come online in the next, next years, but there's not, 
there's not there's probably other priorities first. So my I wouldn't bet highly on on tape coming um, anytime soon. Uh, that said, the the whole point though is like you, you, even taking Falcon aside, the whole point of IPFS is to do content addressing and to enable all the information to be addressed by by cryptographic hash to the point where it doesn't matter where you store it or what media or what system or whatever, as long as you can find as long as it's in the network and you can find it and you can serve it to the user, like that's where that's where you want to be. Uh, sir, uh, can you say one time? And what's your name? My name is Han, uh, Han Tuzun. Uh, like, I guess it's not even possible to verify the source medium. For instance, somebody could pretend that they have a tape, but you would never know at the protocol level, right? Uh, I, I, I'm very wary of saying something's impossible unless, like, it appeals to the, like, unless you can, like, find a law of physics that says it's impossible. It's probably possible. It's just, the question is more, like, is it feasible? Is it, um, is it cost effective, um, and so on. So it really sort of depends. Like different protocol choices might tune. Like there are many environments where people might be okay with a um, a verifiability structure where you have like people running inspections, like actual humans going to inspect data centers, um, and some set of use cases will leverage that, and that's and that's fine. Um, but it sort of like depends on which applications. Many applications won't want that. Many applications want cryptographic. Um, uh, verifiability. So it, it kind of really depends on what people are tuning for. Like different use cases will call for different things, and so then certain protocols, for some protocols it'll, it, it'll make sense. So a good example of this kind of thing, um, not necessarily in storage medium, but in um, renewable, uh, in like just, uh, kind of like the green energy movement, um, one big thing that we're finding is, because we're trying to make all of Filecoin um, not just carbon neutral, but like verifiably green, where like we're, um, uh, net carbon negative, so like we're like having Falcon in your region can like bring down the the, the amount of carbon emissions in that in that environment. What's that? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so so in that environment, kind of what you need is uh, you need certain kinds of um, offsets that have high verifiability about like when they happened, what type of energy was it, what organization is it, um, and so on. And the best thing you can do is run. Um, protocols where you have people actually inspect, inspecting the facilities and you have devices installed at the facilities that can run protocols that are con like checking how much energy, for example, you can create a solar plant and you can inspect that the solar plant was there, you can have people go over and install machines and you can then measure the output of energy coming from that solar plant and you can run periodic inspections to make sure that that is indeed and remains a solar plant and not, not secretly burning coal in the, in the back room or something. And if you, and if you do that, then you can end up with a, a verifiable um, renewable energy credit. Uh, and so at that point, you can, when the solar is coming out of that plant, um, you can measure how much power that is, you can see, say exactly at what point in time it was, and you can end up with like a very good instrument for knowing precisely that like solar power came in from that plant in a particular region. You can then aggregate a bunch of these over time to then like um, say things about the, the energy use of a region or a community and so on. Uh, and that very much is like a verifiability structure, like where you are sending people to those plants to verify certain things. So like, it really depends on the use case. In some use cases, you'll end up with, with that kind of thing. Uh, cool, other questions, thoughts? Yep, back there. Uh, what's your name? Hello. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm John. Um, is there any kind of, like right now, both IPFS and Filecoin are, are very much kind of optimized for the, the, the deal flow where you have like a set of data, you structure that data, you set the deal, you come up with your deal, you do your storage market negotiation and then put that on Filecoin. Um, is there any thought kind of in the roadmap about like more streaming based uh, flows for data, being able to kind of like, freely establish the deal ahead of time and then kind of like migrate or, or se seamlessly kind of stream data into that deal? Yeah, great question. So um, some uh, some people are working on different. So so one part is like the, the thing that's bottlenecking all of that is the FEM stuff, right? So um, uh, sorry, can I get screen back, by any chance? Uh, there we go. So the thing that's bottlenecking that is um, being able to have full smart smart contracts on Filecoin, so you can then create different kinds of storage markets, different kinds of deals, and so on. Uh, once you can do that and you have that programmability, then there's nothing preventing you from creating deals up front that don't even have the CID associated with them, and you can associate the, the CID afterwards. Uh, that's stuff that all has to be built, um, but there's nothing like preventing you from going and 
and, and creating that kind of thing. There's probably a bunch of uh, re-architecting of the contracts to enable that to be, to be easy. Uh, and I know at least like two or three groups that are planning to do that kind of thing. Um, that also enables other kinds of things, like you can do um, space-time futures. Like you can start blending DeFi with storage where you can then kind of can start like um, really commoditizing um, digital storage uh, in particular regions. Like you probably want to get sophisticated about like what regions you're buying those futures in and so on. And you want probably verifiability about uh, the location. I think that's one of the things that needs to um, improve in a lot of these systems. Um, something that is not there yet is like hard proofs of location. So um, there's a big opportunity for somebody to go and create a, a um, proof, proof of location network where you're using n um, nodes around uh, the environment to then pinpoint precisely where particular nodes are. And you can do this, there's a bunch of mechanisms for doing this. One of them is like you can use latency. Um, and if you have a proof of location network, then you can use that to then inform where the data is. Um, so. But but, that, but again, like that's even further out. So somebody has to like go and create a proof of location network to then you being able to use that. But that's sort of like where all this stuff is headed. Um, but you know, over the longer longer arc, um, you know, not this year, probably like in a couple of years or three. Um, uh, yep. So um, it's a question. So in, in the IPFS realm, um, uh, the it's, it's really important that these protocols do not um, create something inside of them that enables any power, any group to kind of like decide what content is bad across the entire network. Like that, that's like a surefire way to like end up with like digital totalitarianism, like <laughs> straight up. So so you really need these networks to enable communities to form together and decide what content they want to move around. Um, now. Very much so, like in different regions of the world, like there will be different opinions about what people should or not be able to move around. Uh, what you want is policies that enable node operators, like people actually running the code and so on, to subscribe to the different kinds of things they want to not let go through those networks. So the way it works today in, in, in IPFS is that um, the main nodes that get takedowns are gateways. So IP, um, HTTP to IPFS gateways tend to get a lot of the MCA takedowns and other kinds of like uh, censorship uh, things. Those are run by specific groups, and they respond to those gateway uh, takedown requests. So, like all of these gateway operators, um, you know, kind of like the we run one of these gateways, we get a bunch of these kinds of takedown requests, and we we uh, serve them. So now, in the in the, the there's probably like a um, an opening here for people to write a um, kind of like some. There's been discussion for many years about creating some kind of like distributed deny list type of protocol where like groups could come together and say, okay, great, like. This is um, DMCA content. Is it like you, you make it harder to get things onto that list, but then people can subscribe to that and decide whether or not to follow it? Maybe there's something there. Um, I'm not sure. It, it might. Uh oh, they're onto us. Uh, the but um, no the the, um, <laughs> the 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 point is like the 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 broader picture here is like censorship is an extremely difficult thing. It, it's very clear that like. Communities need to be able to uh, self-censor when they need to, um, but but you don't want to enable like a, a, a macro-scale actor to then censor everything or censor something completely. Um, and so you you need like this kind of balanced structure where you enable node operators to then decide what content they want to distribute and whatnot. So in the Falcon case, um, you, you can do that kind of thing with uh, storage providers. So storage providers can. Ultimately, a deal is entered into between the clients and the source providers. So at that point, they can sort of decide what to, um, whether or not to store something, whether or not to accept uh, data from that client. What's going to be what's come on, going to be come on here as as it is in the cloud, in the in the traditional cloud, is that users, malicious, or not necessarily malicious, but like parties will will send up, uh, will will send content that's encrypted, will look innocuous, and then eventually it'll get revealed that that's bad content. And so you need a you need a response mechanism to deal with that. Like you you need to at that point be able to like flag that content as bad. Um, in the Falcon case, stop serving it out, and then later let it roll off uh, once once um, it, it uh, once it expires. 
Uh, you could also like delete it ahead of time. Right now, there's no good mechanism for updating sectors. So that th this is like a common feature request of like being able to kind of update a sector to remove some data out. Um, so that might come in, in time, but that's like a um, probably not a super high priority for most groups because it's not that big of a problem. If it became a much bigger problem, it would probably increase in priority. Uh, all right, I think I'm being told to wrap up, so I will stop here. Uh, thanks so much.